Today we're going to talk to you a little bit about our experiences over the last three years. In 2006 we were very fortunate to be able to stand on the summit of Mount Everest. And more recently we've just returned from an expedition travelling from the North Pole to the South Pole using entire human and natural power. Now, two young Britons are about to set off on an epic journey that's never been done before, travelling from the Arctic to the Antarctic by foot, by bike and by yacht. Rob Gauntlet and James Hooper, both 19 years old, will take 11 months to travel the 22,000 miles. 22,000 miles plus. They carry the best wishes of Prince Charles, they're raising money for his trust, and they have a track record. They're the youngest Britons to have climbed Everest. On a spaghetti, ITV News. Between our lower sixth and our upper sixth, we were able to get ourselves in an expedition to go to Pakistan to climb a mountain in the Karakoram region of the Himalaya. And, uh, and that was a fantastic experience, and it just started to allow us to build up the kind of skills that we needed to know that when we went to Mount Everest, we'd be able to cope uh, in a safe way. When you're at that kind of, in those kind of conditions, at that kind of altitude, if something goes wrong, you want to know that you can react from instinct. You don't want to have to think about what you're doing, that could cost you a life. We had to make our way over this headland here. You can see these parallel lines here, these are crevasses. And so they're massive gaping holes in the ice which run these parallel cracks. And they vary often from about a couple of centimetres to several metres wide. You can see also in this picture, it illustrates how strong the wind is. The catabatic winds that come off the Greenland ice sheet are very, very strong all the time. And so what can happen is that the ice, these little ice crystals blowing across the crevasses can form a bridge over the crevasses. So we're skiing along, we're roped together with this pole which weighs more than James, which is quite a lot. Um, and the risk is, is that we can fall in through these crevasses and, uh, and then drop 300 metres to the bottom. I saw my glove drop off the sled. James was ahead with his Indian hunter and I was behind, just sitting down. And it's one thing stopping a car, but stopping 13 dogs is no easy task. So I kind of Persuaded yet? Yeah, okay, I've got to stop. Go and get the glove. Um, I was walking back, and um, I was in this jacket here. James, maybe you can hold it up. And, uh, and I bent down to pick up the glove, which was only 50 metres away. And uh, I felt this distinct crack underneath my feet. And uh, at that point, I knew what was happening. I was falling into the as they pulled me out of the ice. Now, um, the best thing to do in this scenario is I'm very, very wet. I'm losing all my body heat at a huge rate. If you're wet, um, you're losing your heat 50 times faster than you would if you were dry. So James ripped off all my clothes, not simply because of the pervert, because there's actually, <laughs> there's actually, there's actually some signs behind it as well. So, so yeah, Rob, Rob had uh, had a bit of an accident, and um, anyway, most of most of getting out of the ice and not fixing the car shot. Before I started getting in the, into a tent and, uh, and getting walked up, and uh, I called for a helicopter rescue. I was really worried he was unconscious. Uh, he the weak pulse, you wasn't breathing very well. Uh, and I was really worried, I just I wasn't sure about what was going to happen. So I thought the best thing I could do is this call for a hell of a And when we finally got to New York and we were able to sail up the Hudson, uh, it was just a complete relief. Uh, the <coughs> population of Greenland is about 50,000 people. Uh, that's about the same amount as we could fit into two of Manhattan's skyscrapers. So, so for being somewhere where there's literally nobody to this huge metropolis, was a complete culture. The next challenge was to, was to cycle 11,000 miles from New York all the way down to the bottom of South America, a place called Punta Arenas in Chile. Cycling through Texas, we were experiencing temperatures of 48 degrees for a period of 10 days in a row. And uh, really, that was very difficult to deal with. Uh, and only a few weeks before, really, uh, we were experiencing temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees, so almost a 100 degree temperature difference. And uh, our bodies were really wondering what that was going on. During the heat of Texas, we had to drink between uh, 10 and 12 litres of water every single day just to combat that level of dehydration. There was a child in this class uh, who, I mean, neither of us forget, they were asking some questions and uh, he put his hand up at the back and, and, and said, uh, Why is it that in the Arctic you used dogs and not cats? And uh, <laughs> we just thought that was so good, we did it like <laughs> trying to explain to him that actually you know, cats aren't that good at. Uh, Pulling harnesses and sleds, and they don't really like the cold that much. And uh, you've got to completely go as many miles as possible, and we're thinking of any way which we can make things more efficient. Uh, the physicists, and probably the, any cyclists amongst you, will know that if a cyclist goes, um, one goes in front and someone tucks in behind, like they're doing the Tour de France, you can save an awful lot of energy. Save up to 30% by the first person in front taking the wind resistance. So if you swap over, you can suddenly do a lot more mileage for less effort. And so we did this all the time. However, this whole concept depends on 
the person in front being decent enough to warn you about any potential obstacles which might be coming up in front. However, strangely, uh, James saw his role uh, exempt from this. And, um, and so when, we, when he saw this very large broom head, which was in the middle of the road, which had quite clearly fallen off a, cr off a truck, it was very wooden, splintery, and pretty nasty, to be honest. Um, to be fair, you probably only saw it for five kilometres. Um, so it was, uh, to, to recycle it, I was about two centimetres away from his back wheel. And he swerved around it quite nicely. However, I hit it straight on at about 35 miles an hour. Um, plowed into it, buckled both my wheels, uh, did, a, did a double somersault and landed smack on the asphalt. Makes it sound like he was an absolute angel on the bike, so, um, and, uh, and I did. I, you know, I was the one that was causing all the problems. Uh, when we were in Mexico, actually, in northern Mexico, uh, we were cycling along, so this time I was behind Rob, and uh, just nicely cycling along. And then uh, all of a sudden, he just swerves across the road, knocks out my front wheel. I end up flying onto the road and, and just completely cut all down my shin and the bleeding quite nicely. And I need to cycle off. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, when I finally managed to catch up with him, uh, and kind of saying, you know, what was going on then? You know, I was just really cycling along. And, and, why did you just swerve across me? And then he was like, oh, I just got stung in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, seemed like, it seemed like a bit of a strange story to me, the fact that five minutes later, the oh, was perfectly fine. I was like, oh, really got stung in the balls. He probably just knowing quite a while. And then I had this, like, cussing cut on my leg that makes me punch. So, uh, so it's not all quite fine. When we left New York, we had this, this prospect of cycling 11,000 miles. Um, in one big chunk, when you look at it, when we were there, it looked fairly unattainable. However, really, when you, when you take something so large and you break it down into small, achievable chunks, you suddenly realise that that huge mileage can be broken down into a daily mileage, or even a half daily mileage. And perhaps 60 miles in the morning, 60 miles in the afternoon is really quite attainable. If you start adding that, doing that seven days a week, then you realise you've actually done a significant chunk. You can actually cross a country or something um, each week. And then after a couple of weeks or a month, you actually you can see the, the progress that you've made on the globe. And, and really that was the that was the way we tried to stay motivated. And when we had all this mileage in front of us, we had to really think and dream about this idea of crossing the finish line, sailing into Sydney Harbour, having tunnel vision, being able to focus in, entirely on the goal which you set out to do and not and not be put off by these uh, so, uh, so back onto the boat again, we are having nightmares about this after our experience in the Arctic. Um, once again, it was going to be extremely cold and just on the ship pattern where you barely get any sleep. Uh, we were already extremely late in the season, we were, we were trying to cross the Southern Ocean later, uh, to our knowledge anyone tried to cross it any long before. Uh, and so it was already pretty scary with the knowledge that the year before, uh, two boats which had tried to go from South America to Australia without even going down to the South Pole. Uh, both, of, both of them had sunk and someone had died. So, um, so this was all playing on our mind. But, so we stopped on the Falkland Islands and, and this guy was able to, to get his finger mended and flew back to the UK and we waited for another member of the river picked up uh, to about 80 miles an hour. So the waves were absolutely gigantic. Um, this wave basically pushed us off course and as we were trying to crept to the next wave, the steering column snapped with the pressure of turning it one way and the wave the other way. Uh, it just broke, and we ended up careering down the face of this wave and ending up side on to the waves which were coming through. And this wave came down and smacked into the side of the boat, and uh, the boat just kind of took it and then started to roll and roll and roll. And, uh, and the marsh of the boat went from being here to about here uh, on the water, so the boat was completely upside down. The water going absolutely everywhere, uh, I'm kind of hanging on and dangling in midair. Um, and then after what seemed like an absolute eternity, the boat finally turned over and popped back up again. We left the South Atlantic Pole and things started to warm very, very quickly and we suddenly had this prospect of going to some warm climate to civilization. It's a like desolate part of the, um, of the Southern Ocean. And I believe that every single person in this room has their own Everest, and has their own pole to pole, whatever it may be, whether it be doing a certain course or playing a musical instrument or doing an expedition, whatever it is. Uh, if you pull together and help each other out and support and stay focused, use tunnel vision to maintain that, that sight of that goal, you really can achieve anything and impossible. Is that Hopefully this will inspire some questions and we'll try to get those in a couple of minutes time. We're all on 80 degrees, we really want to make people more aware of our environment. Today was the last day that we're going to use public transport or any mode of transport for 
for a period of at 